Father in heaven, we thank you for this morning. Thank you for the time of worship that we've been able to have uh, so far. And Lord, the different ways that we have worshipped. Lord, we now come humbly before you and under your word and ask that you would help us to be undistracted. Lord, remove anything that would uh, pull our attention off and away from you. Lord, give us humble hearts, teachable hearts. Lord, help me to preach clearly and, and boldly and be out of the way of your word. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Good morning, everyone. There is a buzzing happening right now, and I don't know. Hold on one second. Let's see. Is that better? Okay. All right. Good. All right, well, thank you again for being patient with us this morning. We had a bunch of different things, just uh, not go as we had planned, but they went exactly the way the Lord had planned, so that's okay. Uh, let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to James chapter 2. James chapter 2. And we are working through uh, this second half of James chapter 2, this uh, uh, next section, if you will. And uh, in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, we, uh, you may remember from last week, I was explaining that this next kind of major section is broken down into two uh, subsections, if you will, verses 14 through 17, where we've been spending our time at this point looking at faith uh, without works on display, and then 18 through 26, which is faith with works on display. Uh, and I mentioned last week that as we go through all of these, there are some questions that we're going to answer. Last week, we looked at some of them. We defined what faith is according to the Bible. We defined what works are, and even the difference between the kind of works that James is talking about here in chapter 2 and, and in his letter versus even what Paul wrote about in Galatians chapter 2 and Galatians 3 and all throughout the book of Romans and the, the, the battle that Paul and the other apostles were, were fighting uh, against a works-based salvation. Those that would have thought they would have been able to, to be found righteous before God because of obedience to works of the law. And so we spent some time on that last week and as we move forward, we're going to uh, jump into some other terms like justification and what the difference is between justification and uh, by faith alone and justification by, by faith uh, plus works. So there's lots of different things that we're going to get to dive into as we continue on through uh, this chapter. This section, verses uh, 14 through 17, faith without works, it was broken down into three different parts. Last week, we looked at the leading questions. James kicks us off here with some questions saying, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? What's kind of the, the implied answer? What's the expected answer there? What good is it? No good, no good right? Uh, and then he doubles down. Can that faith save him? And the implied answer is no, right? right? He, he's leading us as we read this and the original audience as they would have read this two very specific answers. And I mentioned last week the reason why, one of the reasons why he would even present it in this way is because when it's presented in this way and then even with the example that he gives, it allows us to just affirm the answers to these questions without thinking through the, the implications in our own lives initially. But James doesn't leave us there. James uh, presses us on, presses us on forward, uh, not leaving it in uh, this, this hypothetical with these leading questions, but what we're going to look at this morning and begin to look at in the rest of this section, he moves on and gives us a very practical analogy in this, and that's verses 15 through 16. So uh, follow along with me. I'm going to read this whole section, verses 14 through 17. And then we'll back up to verse 15 here. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, 
without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Uh, Notice here in verses 15 and 16, uh, there's a little bit of a shift that happens. Uh, You may remember from last week, in verse 14, uh, James is using the third-person pronouns, right? He's, he's creating this uh, separation from the one that he's talking about and those he's talking to. He says, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? Right? He keeps it kind of distant so that we can answer those questions, but now it's no longer someone. Now it's no longer they. It's no longer he, but he switches to you to a second person if a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking in daily food and one of you says to him to them he could have just said if someone says to them right but he removes him he removes the 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 mind from the third person and now focusing right to the heart of those who are reading so that they can relate with this but but one of you says to them he gets more personal And this second person pronoun, this you, carries on through the rest of of this chapter. And so what's the picture here that he's painting in verses 15 and 16? There's a person in need. There's someone who's impoverished. There's someone who very clearly is living a life of poverty. This is a, a destitute person. This would be someone who would fall into the category of the poor person. Like he just talked about earlier in chapter 2 when talking about partiality, right? You have the, the, the seemingly rich man that comes in and he's got the, 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 the fine clothing and the jewelry on and you tell that person to, to sit in, in a great place, but the poor person then comes in and there's partiality uh, away from them, partiality toward the rich and against the poor. This is the kind of person that James has in mind here. There's a brother or sister who can't make ends meet. I want to ask you, why why is it that this would kind of strike a a very uh, personal chord to those original readers? Why is that? Who is it that James is writing to here? Who is it? Believing Jews, right? And they were dispersed, right? These are people that had been uprooted, Many of them losing their jobs, many of them losing their belongings and their valuables, and, valuables and, and their land, and even things like family support systems. That's why in Acts chapter 2 and later on in Acts, we see one of the greatest uh, patterns that starts to happen in the early church is that people are caring for one another's practical needs, right? They're, they're selling all their belongings, all that they have, and they had all things in common. Why? Many of them, when coming to the faith, when coming to to follow Christ, even lost their family support systems that they would have had there. And so James is painting this picture, giving this example of a brother or sister who is not richly clothed, like earlier in chapter 2, but poorly clothed and lacking in daily food. Notice, this isn't a person that's just hungry in the moment, right? Right? Uh, This is someone whose life is one of hunger. They are lacking in daily food. The original readers would have very much either been uh, in this category or they would have plenty of names, uh, maybe even faces of those in their midst, friends and neighbors who were in this category. Even think of two very specific categories groups of people that James already mentioned, who are, who are two groups that would fall into this category, uh, that, that could fall into this category, that would very likely fall into this category that he already mentioned back at the end of chapter 1. Widows and orphans, right? They would have very likely been in this category. And so uh, someone had asked me this past week, how it seems like a little bit of a, of, a, of a break in James's flow of arguments and thoughts here. And, and in some ways it is. That's why we even see what good is it, my brothers, right? He uses that term, my brothers, to show that he's bringing on a little bit of, of a different thought here, a different focus. But when we think about what all of James is about, and it's really the revealing the health of our faith and 
He's showing very practical ways that the health of our faith is revealed. There's, there's a thread that's being pulled through all of this as well, thus pointing out widows and orphans and even testing and trials that he started off this whole letter with. And so you have a brother or sister who is poorly clothed, lacking in daily food. They are in the midst of the very trials that James pointed out uh, that, that uh, we're to find joy in. They are uh, living a life of suffering in this way. And although this may be, uh, uh, seem like an extreme picture here, a fellow believer who's lost everything in need, and then you see that need, You've read and you've downloaded everything that James is saying about about trusting in the midst of trials and finding joy and not being partial. And you see that need, but instead of taking action, in this example, he says, but you use mere words. You say some nice things. Maybe not even just nice things. Maybe even say some well-meaning things to this poor person who has been hungry daily. Well, James asks another leading question. If, that, if that's how you respond, if your response is in words, go in peace, be warmed and filled, what good is that, he says? And what's the implied answer? What good is it? No good, no good right? No good. If you, for you to expect your words to, uh, to warm a cold man's body or fill a hungry man's stomach, that, that's foolish, right? That doesn't, that doesn't make any sense. That, that won't solve this person's prob- problem. It doesn't matter how well-intentioned your words are. It will not solve the problem that they are in the middle of. The person will not be satisfied. Right? We, we look at that and, and, and really allow the, the weight and the clarity of this example to, to sink in before we get to why James is even talking about this. Imagine you're the hungry person. Imagine you're the cold person. And someone that you know, that, that is a fellow brother or sister in Christ, or, or even not, just another human being walks by, and they stop, and they look at you, and you think they're going to give you some clothing that will warm you. You think they're going to give you some food that will fill your stomach. And instead, instead, they don't say rude things. They don't, they don't uh, uh, say, say mean things. Instead, they say what sounds like well-meaning things. Go in peace, be warmed and filled. And you would expect at that point it's going to be, here's what will warm you, right? Here's what will fill you. But instead, it says, without giving them the things needed for the body, imagine what that would feel like. It would be, you would think of those words as completely useless, as dead words. So what's James' point here? What's the purpose of this analogy? You you may recognize that I'm using heavily the term picture and analogy and example. And there's a reason for that. You see, I I think we can wrongly look at this text and look at this example and we could really miss the, the whole point because we're focused on the details of it and miss the whole point of what it is that James is trying to say. It's easy to look at this and say, well, well look, James is encouraging us to feed the hungry. James is encouraging us to, to warm people that are, that are cold and help the poor. And, and it's, it's true. We, we should care for one another in those ways, right? Quick reminder of what John writes in 1 John three sixteen: By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? We even think of the context of bearing fruit of repentance in in Luke chapter 3, verse 11. Starting at verse 10, when the crowd's coming to Jesus, and they say, and, and Luke writes, and the crowds asked him of Jesus, what then shall we do? And he answered them, whoever has two tunics it is, is to share with him who has none, and whoever has food is to do likewise. So he's saying, 
share with those who, have, who don't have food and, and share your tunics with those who don't have any. So uh, what, I'm, what I'm not about to say, what I'm not saying is that that's not important things. Those are things that we are to do. We are to care for one another's practical needs. But, but, but I don't think that that is James' concern here. I don't think that's his focus here. It's not his point. Say, so, Joey, how do you know that? Well, he doesn't leave us hanging. Usually, if we have a question that we're left with of what something means in the Bible, what's something that we should do? What's one of the first things we should do? Keep reading, right? Keep reading. We'll look at verse 17. This is the sobering reality, the third part of this section, the sobering reality. Reality it says, so also, that's really important there, so also, even so, thus also, in the same way, so in the same way, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So, What he doesn't choose to say there is, if you are living that way, then that is showing that you have faith without works. That's not what he says. What part of this picture, what part of this example is he focusing on? He's focusing on the deadness of those words to to feed someone. He's focusing on the deadness of those words without action to clothe someone. You could say it this way, the cold and hungry person, upon hearing the words, be warmed and filled, stays cold and hungry. Well-meaning words are not enough to change the circumstances. In verse 20, he uses the word useless regarding faith, and dead in verse 17 regarding faith. And this is the analogy, one who says... The same way you tell the cold person, be warmed and filled, one who says, I have faith but does not have works, does not have true faith. The profession is not enough to change his circumstances. So that's the analogy James is, is drawing there. Remember, he just said, if you say one thing but the works of your lives don't line up with that, it's useless, it's dead. And so he draws an example. Here's a picture of how dead they are. Here's a picture of how useless your faith is, your profession of faith is, if you do not have works. It's just as useless, it's just as dead as if you walk by a cold person and tell them be warmed and and be filled because they're hungry and you walk away. Do do you see the difference there of of what James is focusing us on? And you say, why is that important? Well, it's important because we we don't want to take this text and look at, honestly, what's the easier part and say, all right, let's go start a ministry and feed hungry people. Let's go start a ministry and and clothe uh, uh, cold people and make them warm. The, The hard part is seeing this and realizing that my life, the works of my life don't match up with my faith. And that's how dead it is. That's how useless it is. That's the hard implication. That's the point that James is driving at here. That's where we have to take a step back and pause and think about the implications of this on our lives. One's profession of faith, your profession of faith, my profession of faith, without the verification of works, leaves him dead. Remember, we're we're not talking about works of the law that they would have thought that would have brought them righteousness before God. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about works, fruit of a, a regenerated heart, of a heart that has the Spirit now inside. There's an overflow, a verification of faith. Those are the kinds of works that we're talking about. And so if those works are not a part of one's life, then the question is, And do they have the very spirit in them that brings life? Do they have true faith? Is their faith resting in Jesus Christ? A a faith that is not displayed in how we live our lives is not true faith in Jesus Christ. It's not. Walking according to the ways of the Lord, walking as one who loves the Lord, not should, but will be displayed by how we live. 
it will be displayed in our response to the word of God. It will be displayed in what we think about in, with, when, when we come across his commands. It will be displayed on, in, in so many different ways and in whether or not we want to come uh, around God's people and worship together. It will be displayed when throughout the week if we are pulling away from the body of Christ or we are wanting to get closer and closer no matter how much turmoil or temptation we're in the middle of. It will be displayed when you are alone or around the world and you're being tempted to sin. And in that moment, you make a choice. Am I going to follow the desires of my heart that are luring and enticing me, like James talks about in, in chapter 1, verses 14 and 15, or am I going to break away from that and instead hope that my desires and recognize the desires of the Spirit, not the flesh, that are in line with the will of God. True faith will be displayed in those ways. Faith without works, faith without verifiable works is counterfeit. It's powerless. It's lifeless. It is dead. You think about the opposite of that, right? True faith that is displayed and manifested in works brings us eternal life, brings us true peace and true joy. It's not useless. It's not dead. It's alive. It gives us power over sin. It gives us the, the desires and ability to care for each other, even when we don't want to, even when it's hard to, especially when it's a sacrifice. It's only true faith that will drive us to care for one another in that way. Faith that has merely understood the facts about Jesus and assented to the truthfulness of salvation in Christ, but then stops there. It doesn't display a life of trusting and relying on that reality and devotion to him. Uh, that, that only comes from a true devotion to him. Uh, go ahead and turn to, Ma to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8. Starting at verse 31, gives us the context a little bit. It says, and he, talking about Jesus, and he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed. And 30 days, and after three days, where that came from, after three days, rise again. And he said this plainly. And this is not one of Peter's greatest moments here, right? Poor Peter. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Who did he begin to rebuke? Jesus, right? Ouch. They took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, now talking about Jesus, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And notice what he goes on to say in calling the crowd to him with the disciples. He said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, excuse me, and follow me. He doesn't just say, give, give me a show of hands, right? If you want to follow me, just give me a show of hands or just, just say it out loud, right? Just profess faith in me. No, that's, that's not what he says. He, he gives some clear action. Take up his cross and follow me. What would those listening in that moment, what would they have thought when they would have heard Jesus say, take up his cross? Would they have thought about a, a nice pendant at the end of a necklace? No, right? Would they have thought of something at the front of a pulpit or at the, the, the top of a religious building? No. They would have thought of a horrific form of execution, and that's what Jesus is saying it takes to follow him. That's what he's saying. If anyone wants to come after him, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. 
For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? See, a true faith is shown in devotion to Jesus. Hard, life-altering, life-replacing, transformed devotion to Jesus. It's displayed in obedience to his commands, right? John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. It's displayed through a love for his people. If you struggle with loving the people of God, then, then you have to remember what Jesus wrote in John 13, 35. He made it clear that the very way that you love each other is going to show whether or not you are, whether or not we are his disciples. A true faith that is displayed through a joy in Salvation. Go ahead and turn to First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, starting at verse six. Peter writes, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy. Notice what it's saying here. The, The circumstances haven't changed. In the midst of various trials, where you don't see him, you believe him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Brother and sister in Christ, I want you to let it sink in that, that the joy of your salvation is a part of the works of your faith rejoicing, the action of displaying and and expressing that joy, that is a work of your faith. Why is that important to recognize? Well, if you don't recognize it as that, then what ends up happening? We, we, We try to be joyful in our own efforts. We try to paste on joy on the outside, but guess what? That's not true joy. True joy comes from within, like all the rest of the fruit of the Spirit, Like all the rest of the manifestations and and, and, and visible displays of faith, true joy comes from within. True faith is shown through a joy in that salvation that we have. But not only a joy through a peace in the temporal trials of life because of the hope of eternity that that, that is only found in Christ. So the same way a believer is commanded to have joy, and, and, and has joy because it is an overflow of the work of the Spirit in your life and the faith that you have, guess what? Hope is in that same category. That means that if a believer is constantly in despair, if a believer is constantly looking at the world around them and is filled and driven by anxieties and fears and not, and not focusing their hope on Jesus Christ, and that believer, then we can't stop at just the outward feelings and manifestations of that. That has to drive all the way down to the heart of what's happening with my faith here. My, my faith is being rocked and acknowledging that and remembering what, what Paul writes in Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, Rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So so how does true faith, how, how does faith verified in the realm of hope? Well, Paul doesn't say be anxious about nothing, period. Right? Suck it up. Just move on. Why are you anxious? No, 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 but in everything, you have to do something here by prayer, 
and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. So if you're in the moments or in the throes of anxiety, the Bible tells you, no, 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 be anxious about nothing. And how do you deal with it then? Go to the Lord in prayer. Supplication. Be grateful. Thanksgiving. Get your mind on God. And what is the result? What is the promise? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, So that means you may not be able to to, to draw a thread back to exactly where this came from. You may not be able to see logically how your thought process went from despair and and anxiety all the way to the point of, of peace and hope, which surpasses all understanding especially even the world's perspective or or our perspective when we're in sin, surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That's the display in those moments of true faith, true peace and joy and love and obedience to his commands, devotion to him. Remember the context of what James is saying here. If if those things are not evident in your life, then you have to recognize what James is saying here, that that faith is dead. Faith without evidence of these realities is dead. What I'm not talking about here is the struggle that we all have between the flesh and the spirit. What I'm not talking about is the realities of each and every one of us Struggling with loving other people. Struggling with true, undivided devotion to the Lord. Struggling with finding true joy in our lives or true peace in our lives. That, that is the reality of the sanctification process and the, the war within us that will be happening until we are glorified, until the Lord gives us a new body completely without sin. But if the pattern of a life is to not have love, joy, and peace, and obedience to his commands, and devotion to him. And the question is, first and foremost, are we recognizing those things as sin? Are we recognizing not having those things as sin, and confessing it as such, and then repenting from it, turning from it? It's easy to just say, yeah, I struggle with that. It's hard for me. And then the next day you don't feel it as much, so you just kind of move on. No, no, no. Call it what the Bible calls it, right? Sin and then repentance and move on in your faith in the Lord and rest in his grace. If that's not the pattern of life, if those are not the, if if you have faith by itself without works, it is dead. And not only is that faith dead, but any one of us, anyone that thinks they can have faith without having a life of devotion to Christ to show for it is gravely mistaken. Go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. Starting at verse 15. Matthew writes, this is in the throes of the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus is teaching. Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by what? By their fruits. Are grapes gathered from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? So every healthy tree bears good fruit. Notice he doesn't say every healthy tree should bear good fruit, right? No, no, no. Every healthy tree bears good fruit. But the diseased tree bears bad fruit. A healthy tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a diseased tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus you will recognize them by their fruits. Fruit is evident. It's an option. Fruit is evident in the life of every true believer because he or she has been transformed. Remember what Paul writes in Romans as he's reminding us of the the process that has happened 
and will happen in the life of a believer. In Romans chapter 12, verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. In Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, notice this is past tense. This is talking about something that has happened in the life of a believer. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. What's what's the picture that Paul is painting here? If there's no conforming, there's probably no calling or justifying. That's the the hard truth, but is true. And we should see this as the Lord's grace. Think about it. He has promised... Uh, think about it this way. If, if what the Bible is saying, not if, because what the Bible is saying is that a believer will bear fruit, that someone who has true faith, that it will show in their lives, that they will be more like Christ. Think about what it's saying. That's a promise. Yeah, we, we want to look at this text and See, if, is, is this faith verified that we have? But this is a promise to his children that God will complete the work that he has started, as Philippians 1 even talks about. This is a promise to the reality that you are a new creation if your faith is in Jesus Christ. And if your faith is not in Jesus Christ and you're, you're hearing all of this, let me just remind you that you were created Everyone around you has been created. Everything around you has been created. And we know who created each and every one of us, who created this world. God, a holy God, the holy God. And when we say holy, we mean he is other than us. We mean he is pure. There is nothing unrighteous, nothing wicked in him, only righteousness. And so it makes sense that when he created all things, he created it with a righteous, perfect standard, a good standard. And yet, you may or may not know this, but in Genesis chapter 3, after Adam and Eve had been created, the first human beings to be created, they turned away from God's righteous laws and statutes, and they instead wanted to make themselves an authority. And every single human being has done exactly the same thing since then, except for one, Jesus Christ. What the Bible explains is God in the flesh, and he lived a perfect life, and he lived a perfect life and displayed a true obedience and submission to the will of the Father as, as has never been seen and will never be seen again all the way to the point of death on a cross so that you, if your faith would be put in him, that your sins can be forgiven. The, the, the break of God's law, the sin that brings about guilt in your mind and in your heart, the sin that has ruined this world, And for honest has ruined your life, that sin can be forgiven. But your faith has to be put in Jesus Christ. The very thing we're talking about. It's not just hearing the words I'm saying and saying, yeah, I I acknowledge what you're saying. It's not just hearing the words that I'm saying and what the Bible teaches and saying, I acknowledge it. And yeah, I believe that that's true. But it's placing your trust and confidence in Jesus Christ for your salvation. That's the good news of the gospel. And that has to come first. That has to come first. Any other way to approach this is like, as I've heard one person say many times, I don't even remember who, it's like stapling fruit to the outside of a tree, right? That, that fruit is not going to survive. That's not that tree's fruit. No, true fruit of a life of one whose faith is in Christ only comes from a life and a heart that has been born again. That's the message of the gospel. 
So if you have any questions about any of that, if that's new to you or if you've heard it before and you just want to talk more about that, I would love to talk with you more after service. I know many here would love to do the same and open up God's word to share with you the, the, the ins and outs of the gospel. Well, next week we are going to push forward uh, out of this first section and instead of looking at faith without works, we're going to look at faith with works. We're going to look at things like, is this a matter of obedience to the law? Are we, what is it that we're talking about here, about justification and, and even some Old Testament examples that James points out to us to show us what it means to have faith that would be on display. And so as I close us here, let me just, and before we turn the corner next week to faith with works that is displayed by works, not being saved by those works, but displayed by works, uh, allow the text that we have spent time in already to challenge your heart, to, to really expose areas in your life where you may just be professing faith, but you're not actually living that out. Uh, that, that maybe there are areas in your life that you would recognize and be honest and say, oh, there, there are works there, but it's not works of righteousness. It's works of wickedness and of the world and of darkness. And allow the word of God to, to root those out and in confessing those as, as, as sin and, and repenting from them that he would bring about a, a true forgiveness and, and wholeness to your faith. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for the very promise that we can rest in, that you have started a work in your children. For anyone whose faith is in your son, whose trust and confidence is in Christ, who have the faith that even that in and of itself is a gift from you, that you will complete the work that you have started. Lord, that we will see victory over sin in our lives in, in, in growing ways. Lord, ultimately pointing to eternity where we will be completely sinless before you, worshiping you without any distractions in our hearts or our minds. Or the flesh will be done away with, the sinful flesh will be done away with, and we will be clothed in, in new bodies that will be fit, <coughs> fit for eternity and worship to you alongside each other. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to be discerning of our hearts of where our faith is at. Lord, allow there to be growth in uh, true works of righteousness, true works as a verification for our faith. We love you, Lord, and pray this in your name. Amen.